The Bible reading is from Acts 16, verses 1 to 10. Troas, the end or the beginning. He, that is Paul, came to Derbe and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived. His mother was a Jewess and a believer, but his father was a Greek. The brothers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Paul wanted to take him along on the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they traveled from town to town, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and the elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. The next part is entitled, Paul's Vision of the Man of Macedonia. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia, standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, he got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. May God add his blessing to this reading of his word. I'm not sure where a month uh, has gone. It seems to have flown by fast. But this is the uh, last Sunday of our sort of reflection on a series of passages from Acts that uh, focus on discipleship. We've started out with looking at baptism. We've looked at what it means to live in, uh, to, to live into that calling and to see where the Spirit's moving. We've looked at what it means to live our lives with hands that are open and not live with hands that are shut. Uh, in addition to all that, we sort of built up to this final passage uh, that we're looking at in Acts. Uh, believe me, though, there's much more we could have covered. But this last passage from Acts where we find Paul really putting what we've talked about into action. But before we get into the passage, it, it sort of reminds me of Paul going on this road trip uh, in this reading from Acts 16. And I don't know about you, uh, but for me at least, uh, I've been sort of told that road trips can be the make or break point uh, for human relationships or families. They can really put people to the test because uh, things go wrong, right? I mean, well, has anyone gone on a road trip where at least something hasn't gone wrong? I'm going to take those last as, as no, so <laughs> I think it happens to all of us. Even for myself, uh, for my family, when we've gone on a cross-country trip, we went uh, cross-country in a caravan, as you call them, or an RV, we might say back home. Uh, it was one about 35 feet long and 13 feet tall. Um, not like anything of uh, the caravans I've seen here. Uh, <laughs> but we were driving through the city, and we almost made a wrong turn to go under a bridge in St. Louis where it was just a few inches uh, shy of what we needed to height-wise. And if we went under, if we kept plowing through, uh, we would have lost our roof. But luckily, uh, my mom, who was the navigator, said, whoa, <laughs> she, she alerted us to it and we avoided a near catastrophe. Stories like that, they are stressful. Uh, perhaps in that moment especially. Looking back on them, though, I think more often they, on than not, they are stories that we can look back on with a sense of humor, with a sense perhaps of, of uh, being able to just laugh at those times. And I bring up these mistakes or these mishaps that often happen, that can happen in road trips, because sometimes the mistakes we make or the mishaps or the misdirections not all of them are 
bad. Not all of them lead to something that is catastrophic. Sometimes they lead to something that is unexpected and beautiful. I don't think Paul, though, was feeling that way initially in the reading from Acts. We hear Paul is going on this trip with the disciples who had gathered with him, and they try to go to all these different places, as you heard Jim say in the reading and as you saw on the map. They try to go to all these different places, but while the Spirit of God keeps them from going there. That's the only explanation we're given. We're not told anymore. Perhaps the roads had been washed out along the way. Perhaps there was conflict in the regions where they were trying to travel and they couldn't get to where they wanted to go. We're not told any of that, but we're told that the Spirit kept them from going there. And so the only option that's left for them is to make their place to a town called Troas. If you go to uh, visit Troas today, there's actually a, um, how would I describe it? There's actually a mosaic there that, they've, that you can find that depicts Paul finding a place to rest. And in this mosaic, you can see Paul uh, depicted on the outskirt of Troas in this cave uh, he found for a shelter. And he's leaning against these hard, uncomfortable-looking rocks. And you can see the bags under his eyes as if he's not gotten a lot of sleep and he knows things are not going the way he wants them to. You can imagine in this mosaic, Paul looking up in bed at night during his time of prayer, looking up and asking God, God, why, why would you send me here to this place? It's not where I wanted to go. Now, don't get me wrong. There there was nothing terrible about Troas. Troas, though, was this, just this place. There wasn't much, it wasn't known for a lot of things. It was this little historical fishing village on the outskirt of where uh, that led to Europe. Metaphorically speaking, we might think of Troas as this place where the dreams or the hopes we had find themselves, they find themselves winding up there. Perhaps Paul had these grand visions of what he wanted him, his ministry to look like if he was able to go out east or if he was able to go to these other places because they would have been grand adventures and grand parts of his ministry, but he finds himself but he finds himself in Troas. It's interesting for us to think about what Troas might be for us. What are the parts in our lives that we identify perhaps as disappointments is one way to phrase it. But what are the places perhaps that we might imagine being uh, that for us? Perhaps it was a goal we had for our occupation or for our job. Perhaps it was a relationship goal or perhaps it was even something within our own practice of faith that didn't end up the way we wanted it to. And so that becomes Troas for us. This place that almost seems sort of like the end and sort of seems like a place where we just settle. And who could really blame Paul as he finds himself in this situation? After all, he was pouring out so much of himself, so much of his ministry into what he was doing, believing he was following the call of the Spirit, only to find himself in Troas. I think if we aren't careful, we'll find ourselves in a place like Paul trying to brute force our way to going to the place we think we want to go without actually listening to where the Spirit is leading us. I think it's easy, especially now, to think that we are missing out if things don't go our way because it seems to be all the messages we receive. We're told that if we do things a certain way, then we'll make the, the salary we always dreamed of. We're told that if we change a certain portion of our lives, then that will make us more attractive. We're told that if we do whatever you want that X to be, 
then it will come true. All you have to do is put all your energy into it. But we're reminded constantly in our reading from Scripture throughout this series of discipleship that our way is not always God's way. There are places in our lives we may think is best for us, but God has something else in mind. We won't always know where it is we're going or how we ended up, perhaps in a particular place, if it's not where we wanted to end up. But regardless of that, what's important for us is that we remember the Holy Spirit is with us. That the Holy Spirit of God is with us, ready to make a new thing happen, even if we are not able to see it yet. Perhaps that's what the Spirit laid on Paul's heart as he went to sleep that night. I'm sure his fellow companions were happy when he finally went to sleep. Perhaps Paul, I imagine Paul being in a bit of a mood uh, as he went to bed that night. Whenever I'm grumpy or when I'm feeling that way, I'm told I should take a nap uh, or I am told I should grab a cup of coffee, which while I love the coffee here, uh, I do miss a little bit of my coffee back home. <laughs> but I'm told to, you know, get rest. And rest is such an important piece as well that's highlighted in our reading for today. Rest as this spiritual practice, a way to reset our hearts, a way to reset our bodies, a way to reset ourselves so that we can be receptive to what the Spirit is laying on our hearts. It doesn't do us good if we keep trying to push through our exhaustion because that only leads to burnout, not just for people who are in the church, people who are disciples, even pastors as well. It is a temptation we must resist to just keep pushing without any rest. Brute forcing our way to success or to where we want to go does not work. And sometimes the only solution is to find a spiritual and physical rest. This kind of stepping back from a problem that we're facing, this kind of resetting of our hearts, of our souls, it reminds me a little bit of a, a poem from a, a poet back home uh, by the name of Wendell Berry who writes this lovely poem called The Peace of Things. And there's a line in the poem where he says, I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought or grief. I come into the presence of still water and I feel above me the day blind stars waiting with their light for a time. I rest in the grace of the world and I am free. Rest is a spiritual practice, and it is a key component, I think, to discipleship that goes hand in hand with everything we've talked about so far, whether it be living out our baptismal covenant or giving with hands that are open. All those things are great, and they are actionable, but like all things, they require a bit of rest because discipleship is a long haul journey. It's this marathon run. It's not a sprint or a dash that we see on track and field day. Navigating the path of understanding God's will can be a pretty exhausting task. Part of me wonders if we're seeing results of, of that today the exhaustion or the tiredness uh, perhaps that Paul was feeling, if we, are seeing result, uh, if we are seeing that in our church today. Perhaps you hear, perhaps you saw that things might have picked up during the uh, pandemic years, but like many churches back home as well, even as things reopened, we know that not everyone is coming back into the church for one reason or another, and they're all valid reasons, but what if one of those reasons is because people are tired? What if it's that they're not just tired in a physical sense, but spiritually tired, or they're spiritually burned out from trying to keep things going, or whatever that may be? What if that is part 
What if that is part of what we are seeing? And what then does it look like for the church, for you all, for all of us to step in and not just cast the vision forward, but to also cast a vision for what it looks like for us to restore the practice of spiritual rest in a way that nurtures communities, in a way that nurtures hearts that are weary, hearts that are looking to be filled and restored by the Spirit of God. Perhaps Paul was wrestling with all of this in his mind as he went to sleep that night. And what a relief it must have been when the Spirit brought to Paul the vision of the Macedonian man beckoning to him, calling out to them to to come and spread the good news of the gospel. Because as we talk about Troas, there's this perhaps belief that Troas is the end of the journey. It's the place where we end up being stuck, but it is actually only just the beginning, especially when we turn that over to the spirit. When we turn those moments over to the spirit like Paul, we find that the spirit's transformative power always surprises us, always brings a sense of amazement. As we find that paths that we thought were closed are open, and we're reminded that Troas is not the end, but it is just a stopping point, a place for rest along the way. We see this a lot throughout Holy Scripture. We see this story sort of play out in other parts of Scripture. The story of people having their own expectation of how life is going to be, but God turns it on their head. God turns the plan on its head. We see this in the story of Moses, who really just wanted to sort of fly under the radar and keep the status quo, but was called by God to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt. We see Simon and Andrew who probably just assume that they are going to live their lives as fishermen until someone called Jesus comes along and offers to them, extends to them something that changes their life, inviting them to become fishers of men. Mary, too, perhaps had a vision to live an ordinary life alongside Joseph until an angel of the Lord disrupted her plans entirely. Our plans are not always the same as God's. And when we hit a dead end or a roadblock, it only means that we must open our hearts, our spirits, to the possibility that God has something else in mind. Because our responsibility does not lie in trying to achieve or trying to make something that is perfect, whether it be our lives or our ministry or our occupation. It's not our job to make everything flawless because that role belongs to God and to God alone. When we examine Paul's journey, we realize that Troas is not the end, but it's the beginning And it was the beginning for a missionary journey that would spread the good news, not just to Europe, but would have lasting impacts of spreading the good news to all corners of the earth. For us, it's a reminder that when we find that we hit a dead end in our visioning of what church can be, of what our discipleship can be, it's a reminder that in those moments, if we draw nearer to God in our practice of faith, then we too can see that we have not hit the end, but the beginning. It's because the Spirit of God that walks with us through our journey of life and faith knows the roads we travel. And the Spirit of God will guide us through life's twists and turns. And what a joy that is for us, knowing that we do not do this thing called ministry, discipleship alone. The Holy Spirit, as we have looked throughout this whole series, is this catalyst. It is the fuel that guides us as we traverse the waters of life and faith. 
the Spirit of God as it hovered over the turbulent waters at the start of creation is with us here in the present as we discern what it means to be the church today. One of the things I know that as, as, uh, as uh, it's been announced a few times is the question of what can the church do that's new? What new ministries, what new points of connection can we make? And the thing is, the th well, the thing that I would encourage you is to keep offering ideas. Because ideas, whether they are messy or not, whether they work or not, that's not the point. The point is that we o open to at least trying them and listening to where the Spirit is leading us in our exploration of what we are called to do. The point is, is that we as a church should not get caught up in failures or being worried about if we will end up in Troas, but instead ask, what's next? What else can we try? In our attempts to be the church and our attempts to be better disciples, disciples that are growing in faith, we will undoubtedly end up in Troas. But it is in Troas that the Spirit will inspire us to pursue feats beyond anything we could have imagined if we are willing to trust that our work is a part of God's larger tapestry for our lives. And it is not an end to what we do. It is only just the beginning. <laughs>